What's up, Shark Nation? We are live back from Grey <laughs> Greystone Studios. Here we've got uh, our guest uh, Al Maser, um, street artist. Uh, we've been waiting to have a chat with Al for a while. Um, we're both really big fans. Mark's here as well. He's from uh, he's he's live from uh, Sally Noggin slash I never I never really got it right uh, <laughs> where where that's based, but uh, and it's then, on the border. Uh, it's on the border. I would say the border. So it's kind of a nice place to be. Uh, you're keeping it real, but you're uh, you know. Uh, Sorry, in my life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just on the in the grey area. But we, uh, Al, Al, I think you wanted to come down to uh, to Greystones for a for a dip in the sea, but uh, maybe next time. Yeah, 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 yeah. That'd be, sure. that, that'd be brilliant. Because um, I had been living until last uh, February. I'd been living in Dublin eight, um, so I've been around uh, a lot of the, the the work and if anyone's listening here i'm sure a lot of people that are listening are are mark's fans with the art as well so they they definitely know uh Maser. but uh it's fair to say that a lot of the the kind of the color around the city the 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 kind of uplifting vibes from any murals that you've been seeing it's it's pretty uh we're pretty sure that you've been uh, seeing some of uh, Mesa's work all over the place as well as some of the some of the biggest movements in uh in Ireland over the past 10 years uh Mesa's been involved with um even the the repeal the eighth campaign that was a big kind of meme in the so even if you don't know it was uh Mesa's uh image on the t-shirts on the on everything you know um, it really made an impact. Um, so we might just jump in, Mark. If you've got uh, any questions for uh, me, so we can get cracking. I'm I'm always interested, and thanks thanks Mill for coming on. Uh, I really appreciate it, and I've been a fan of your work for for a while. Um, like I tend to like artwork that's nothing like mine, so I I wouldn't uh, I would never hang my own stuff on my wall. So it's all, it's always other other kind of types of art. So uh, for every look, picture behind Mill. you. Say it again. Except for every painting behind you. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the ones that didn't sell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. I've a load of them. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm always interested like, to, to, to go back to the start and, and find out, you know, how how you became an artist or how, what was it that kind of triggered the interest? Can you remember when, like I remember personally, I won a, a competition when I was five to, to exhibit my snowman in the the national art gallery for a week or whatever it was and i don't know if that was what made me think i was good and then i had to live up to that or what or, and then i just become i became super interested in like color and books i'd actually copy the color and book and draw it and color it in myself so i oh. became like a, a human printer which i probably still am yeah. but uh lacking a bit of creativity but uh well how did that kind of come about for you um unfortunately there wasn't any eureka moments or any like pinnacle points uh, when I look back on it that were um, of huge significance. Um, my earliest memory of art would definitely be Adam Barry, tracing that Adam Barry book. Um, uh, yeah, I got copied that. Um, shooting on down a vague recollections of getting those little colouring sets and we could get down like a little watercolour set or a little mini canvas and Doing little shit boats and flowers and <laughs> fucking whatever. I only remember that because maybe 15 years later, it might be still in the same spot on the windowsill in, in my mom's house, like you know. So, um, she kept stuff for yours, did she? My parents didn't oh, keep any of them. She threw shit out as well, though, man. <laughs> <laughs> I called her. Really worth something. When I left my when I left the house uh, over 20 years ago, um, I I don't know. I called up to her or something there, and uh, there was a skip out the front, and there's a bit. Like eight canvases thrown in it, and she was like, oh, "I thought you didn't want them thrown up, thrown up in the attic, or whatever." And I just thought she used them. Another way you build a skip, but you use them to build a wall. To just... <laughs> it's, 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 it's all like my mate's is... face, like that bank, like sticking out a wow. skip, and my bike fucked in it as well. And uh, I took a photo of him, put it up Amazing. on Facebook at the time, and uh, thought, I thought it was hilarious. Someone scared and found the gaff and pulled the canvas, pulled a few of the canvases out. So that maybe had been a moment to where I thought there might have been a bit of work in my work. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. This is a... But, uh, no, back, back, I definitely, um, you have me thinking now, jogging my memory a bit, and there's a moment, uh, like if we look at moments, my art teacher in school um, allowed me to paint, and paint a mural on, on the wall in the art room. Um, I was very interested in graffiti and street art, uh, took photos of it and I'd quite, yeah I think I think I think it was sort of nurtured by my 
our teachers a little bit at the very, very start. Um, definitely wasn't the best in class or anything. Maybe as a teacher's pet, maybe I just licked, licked up enough, but I definitely wasn't, uh, I feel I wasn't the most talented. I'm, I'm basing that on my junior cert projects and leaving cert projects and stuff like that. Um, but I think, uh, you know, there was there, there, there was a culture there and it still is a culture of that. Um, it, it's not a profession, it's a hobby. You know, that uh, passions are hobbies and that they're not careers. And not that my parents were forcing me away from that, but it was in my mindset as a secondary thing, you know. And so I, I, I uh, was always there in my life and um, say there. I didn't have a lot of artistic friends either um, growing up. And then I found graffiti and street art, and I think that's where the love uh, gave gave a, a purpose and reason and blossomed and all and, that. You know? And did you find that on on the streets of of Dublin, or was it pictures, or was it a documentary, or was it America? Where was it? Um, my first memories of it, there's tags um, around rap mines and stuff like that, and uh, fucking everywhere actually, because I was very young, so we were, you know, we weren't traveling too much. Charles Cross, that's what there is. And it was a tag called Fresh One, and I loved the hand style. It was, it was everywhere. Um, I think years later, he ended up getting into politics and turning his back on graffiti. And he, really? Yeah, that, yeah, that's true. Great find. It's probably bullshit. Not Leo Varadkar, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking never know. Um, <laughs> I might look into that. <laughs> but uh, that was it. And then my mate Goose, his brother Lachlan, um, he... <laughs> He was into hip hop and graffiti and he had a tag called Rhythm. And I loved that scene. I remember like Robin's kind of spray paint. And then as I got older, I ventured a little bit further out and saw uh, names like Rez and ID. And these, this is like 95, 96. And, and then I started to understand the culture a little bit more. I came across a magazine in uh, Forbidden Planet. Do you remember that shop? Is that yeah, still? I still go there. Yeah, I bring the kids there. Yeah. So remember, remember it used to be on Dawson Street? Yeah, before now it's on so, the keys, right? Yeah, yeah, it used to be. Yeah, on yeah. The street. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've been there, just looking at comics, you know, um, uh, different sort of Marvel comics and shit like that. And uh, I came across Graffitism, and there's a publication there. It was like my first sort of index into graffiti outside of Ireland, and it was primarily uh, illegal graffiti based in London, Bristol, areas like that. And I was just like my new bible and we bought and i bought it i went split it with my mate dave and we bought it and shared the magazine and i still have the magazine and um, years later i was featured in that my publication loads and they brought me over to their uh, warehouse and saw like the first issues like it was it was a staple part of uh, the history of uh, european graffiti um but yeah it all just sort of came from there blossomed from there really and uh Moving on, so I'm just sort of jumping. I'm trying to think back. Moved on then to uh, there's a shop in town uh, by some stoner fella. I can't remember his fucking name. It's Shaggy or some shit. <laughs> and, uh, he had a graph shop there, which then became either this girl either took it over then became B boy, and that was like a B boy slash graffiti shop. That's where you got your spray paints, and when you went in there, that's where you met your peers, you know. And there's people as a, there's a crew there. called the TDA clan, and uh, I'm a part of that crew now. And that's where they sort of hung out, and that's where I saw the big, the big shots, you know. And I sort of uh, looked up to them and inspired to be them. And through my a lot of painting and stuff like that, got the opportunity to go paint with those guys and mentored me, and now become once actually a housemate. Now, okay, oh, hey. very good. And, yeah. so, and sorry, go ahead, Luke. I was going to say when you're when you're part of a group like that, is, is that does that mean you guys go out and do like collaborative uh, pieces, or is it just like that you're you're kind of hanging around with like-minded people. What, what what does that mean to you? For sure, both because yeah, like-minded is a good <laughs> thing to talk about because you definitely, as an artist, remember I said I didn't. My social group weren't <clears throat> very creative. Um, they were just into so yeah, it's just another social group like a football team almost. So you're like-minded, shared same conversations. Maybe you could feel like as a kid in hindsight, look back, you definitely are orbiting on that periphery where you don't, you're not feeling inclusive to other um, groups. Um, so this is a, a subculture a community that you definitely felt a part of so that resonates into crews then um, okay. and being a part of that clique and you go do collaborative walls go do illegal graffiti together and just like a little like I say gang but you know what I mean like you yeah. a crew that you hung out with and it, it develops on then to to a housemate yeah <laughs> And for, with graffiti, like on the technical side, like yeah. 
how do, how does that all what are the different types you know is there entry level and then do you, do you gradually get more and more detail or does everybody just have their own style and there is no kind of set technique there was set techniques years ago and the world opens up with the internet and uh, styles cross pollinate and everyone gets influenced off different stuff and uh, art is subjective as, as is graffiti but like the fundamentals really are as you start off you become a tagger you would tag your name around the place and, and you continue doing that um, and then develops onto like a trope or quicker sort of stuff like a lot of people familiar with to see bigger pieces in the street on shutter it's silver fill in and black outline and it's usually rounded so it's it's quicker to you know you quite you have to be quite immediate on the execution of it um then it develops onto pieces masterpieces productions of backgrounds and different stuff so it's whatever tickles you uh, some people want to just stay within the structure of doing illegal graffiti and they might have political reasons for that or anti-establishment or they just love the adrenaline or the social aspect of it or the experience you know painting trains others for me i experienced that and um, but i definitely felt a little bit more fulfillment when i was painting when i spend longer time on like when you're being in an abandoned warehouse and you get to spend a day on it and uh sort of <clears throat> nurture that creative side a little bit more um so that's sort of where i went with it and those journeys and experiences that you have are like the most memorable ones for sure. You know, getting up in the morning, packing your bags and you're going out to Luke and some fucking or reservoir somewhere and you have to pack extra socks and a five spot for a few joints during the day and a little Sambo. And, yeah. and you're there with like-minded friends and you love them. And you like, yeah, it was just re- really, really memorable learning good, good times, you know. And where does the... Like so, that that transition then from the the illegal stuff that and I when you were explaining that I could really like uh, it's not something that I've been involved in, but I can imagine the uh, the excitement of that, you know, uh, you know the the you know the thrill of you know yeah, is someone going to come and kind of catch us out here? But like, what what's the transition to painting the uh, murals where you can spend a little more more time? Do people start to reach out to you and say, "I've got this wall, I'd love to." you to put your stamp on it or how does how does that work like yeah yeah so like well that trail of like will i get caught that trail suddenly goes away when you're fucking running away from someone right. <laughs> <laughs> suddenly switches to like pray to god i'll never do this again if i get away uh, <laughs> but um so that that development there that journey changes but then also culturally you you know side by side culture changes so 15 years ago there wasn't a need there wasn't an open market there wasn't this understanding of the culture subculture um if you want to like a quick overview of it probably i could say banksy opened up those doors for people you know became very um um acceptable and uh, mainstream a little bit and it's you know kudos to that dude man he's he's fucking he's a phenomenon like what, what he's does in his work ethic as well as his messaging and um but anyway um so yeah if, if i probably it's if, if the journey of where i wanted the artwork to go a different way maybe i wouldn't be here talking to you guys and uh, maybe because i had a little bit of an artistic um need to fulfill coupled with the graffiti that it's lent lend me here and at the same time cultures change people are more acceptable but they see that there is a significance as much as you know there should be more if you ask me and that 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 we, that's the visual arts in ireland you know um uh how important it is and i don't think it's been uh getting its uh recognition but sure that's fucking that's what it is um so but yes yeah, it's, it's changing now to where yeah there's opportunities come like and you you, you get asked to do walls but 90% of it is you just painting and enjoying it and doing that. And for every 100 pieces you do, then you might get this cool opportunity of someone ask you to do, do a project. That's cool. And then it's different now, like fucking everyone's just doing a project to just because they're being asked to do projects, you know, and they haven't put in the hard work. Yeah, <laughs> when, when you, to go back to, say, finishing school, what was your kind of thoughts around what, what, what you were going to do after? Did you believe that you could actually do this full time or even part time or you know what way did it work from from that age did you, uh, know, did you have to go abroad or anything um i i didn't ever think no because i couldn't i couldn't foresee that there'd be this opportunity because this had never existed you know when i was in school there was no 
graffiti street artist who was making a living off what they're doing. To the, the biggest extent that we knew, and TDA clan, those guys I speak about, Mark, Darren, all those guys, they're leading the way. But to, the, the biggest opportunities that they got at the time, what my knowledge of it is when I was in school, was you might have fucking painted a beer garden, or you might have been decorating a nightclub, or you might be doing a sign, you know, that was it. Um, so it wasn't that. Um, when I was in school, I, de- I remember there was a conversation with a guidance counsellor, and she was trying to, it was between either geography and business, geography and art or business and art or something like that. She was trying to steer me off art. And I remember just looking at her going, you fucking mad egg. Like, <laughs> it's the only one thing I'm good at and you're yeah. trying to stop me from doing it. You know, you know <laughs> so, um, so I listened to her. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I think, man, I was lost. Uh, if I think about after school, I was definitely lost and, and I can, Remember that because it was, uh, um, I was, I, and I'm basing that on my memory of zero motivation, lack of energy, and motivation, and that was just I think I was just lost on purpose, you know. And uh, maybe a lack of guidance. Uh, lack of guidance, yeah, uh, maybe a bit. Like, God, like we're we're in such a culture now with this guidance and mentorship and all that. There was I'd never heard of these terminologies or language or anything like that. Like, you know, you just hung out with your mates and you lived week by week. And I, I, I continued that narrative all through my twenties as well. Um, <laughs> but, nice. uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to remember back now, but it definitely wasn't, um, something that I, I could think that there was a career in. I was at the same time I was doing like, you know, just little odd jobs when you were younger, you were cutting grass and washing cars and, uh, shit like that and then I became a kitchen porter in a, in a hotel and I really really fucking loved that because um, previous to that when I was a kid I was talking to my girlfriend about it before that um, I was uh, I used to go down to go down the country my, my family my, my mum's side of family from Limerick so I used to go down there and spend the summers down there I had some summers with my dad and his brothers in Roscommon um, bagging turf and you wouldn't get paid you know it's just a family holiday yeah. <laughs> and uh so I remember getting this job as a kitchen porter and getting paid for the first time and it's like fucking amazing and I was you get paid to, to work and I really loved that and all the new people I met and I continued that and uh, then became a comedy chef <clears throat> and I really loved all that and uh, so I think maybe my mind was there a little bit in that you know and wasn't practicing art loads at certain parts of my life you know but it luckily came back to me and when was it what year do you think it was or what was the trigger that you thought look I can make something of this or this is this is a bit of a cultural sh- shift maybe yeah um well so after school I went into the PLC course at school organ you know where you because I didn't have the points I got like 180 in my leaving or something fucking atrocious um well no that's so good so yeah. <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> all the 180s <laughs> some, people, you know, some people would love to do their leaving cert <laughs> yeah. yeah like and I fucking don't agree with that fucking leaving cert yeah. so um no, we're not big fans on the, on the I, podcast it's not good not because of my points, but just the pressure that that put on me, man, as a kid and how much I hated school and that structure, that fucking Romanesque, amphitheater, dictatorship of school. It's fucking, the suppression that that has on, on a mindset of a young, developing mind. It just, I could go on about that for ages. Um, so I uh, I did a PSC course and I, I've, I went into this world where I got to learn loads of different disciplines. It was just, just art, you know, and I really loved that. And I was like, oh, I'm going to be an artist. And I, and I got into Dunleary because I did really well in the portfolio. And I did fine art and wasn't feeling it. And did a year, I did about half a year and um, probably hanging out with the wrong people, probably having a few cans at lunch, but didn't help and that sort of shit. And I ended up dropping out anyway. And I remember those days of like half a year of going like, oh, what the fuck are you doing with yourself? And sort of getting up and just sort of getting out of the gaff for a while and moseying about town. And, and then I went back with, uh, being a, um, a comedy chef and so then graphics design came about and that was sort of like I had a bit more of a, a, a purpose to it now all during this time I was still doing a lot of graffiti and painting loads and loving that and I, I found uh, graphic design visual communications because it sort of lent itself to it, it was like um, what I learned from graphic design is uh, it's like the study of typography and layouts and in some way and you know colour and all that and yeah. in some way uh, Art and graffiti was too, you know, but it's abstract topography. You're skewing the type to mimic the re- to transform it into what way you want. And then that coupled with a layout of a wall and color. So they amalgamated really, really well. And um, 
so I did graphic design. I really fucking loved it. And a great teacher called David Smith. And uh, where did you do graphic design? In, in Dunleary. Went back to Dunleary. And uh, David Smith taught me, and he really taught me discipline and good work ethic. You know, and he was he was like the Gordon Ramsay of the of the design world. Like he'd nice. take joy out of seeing seeing us cry <laughs> at certain times. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I really hold a lot to that man, you know. He, uh, we're, still, we're still friends, you know. He's, uh, I base my my business. He's a business called Atelier David Smith, and I've got Atelier Macer after him, you know. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so back then with graffiti, I I, I, uh, I finished college, and so so during college, then I was actually working in a shop in town, a skate shop, on the weekends and Thursday evenings, and then when I finished the course, I went back working there full time, and then started doing my own little gigs. I could see opportunities there is doing window display, you know, for brands and little nixers here. And I got to stage then where it's like, oh, there's a commercial opportunity here to do all these little uh, gigs. And what they'll do is it'll just fund my revolution, meaning I'm get to paint my own artwork, you know, and I'll have the freedom and I get to live my own life and all this shit. And so I did. And I took that plunge uh, in my mid 20s. <clears throat> And it was a struggle and, you know, like most artists are struggling and you're hustling to do work. But um, I was definitely savvy in uh, pursuing opportunities and, you know, down to like painting pub signs or, or an advert for a beer company or any shit like that or in, in offices or any, the amount of crap I did looks unbelievable and I don't like to show. Um, and that's sort of think of where I started then. But what happened then, if I think about it now, is... I created this monster because it was like great. As no one had done it, we have uh, we have um, collectives now, commercial collectives that are doing uh, street art murals. But to be honest, a lot of them don't. Their intentions aren't true, and they're just sort of bastardizing the scene because they don't. Come, they're not artists. They're CEOs of whatever. And uh, so the, I created this sort of fucking monster where there was this massive need for it, and then it took all my time and energy, and. Inherently, as an artist, you have this need to create your own work, as you know. And uh, if you're if you're answering um, to the brief of others continuously after a while, it gets mentally exhausting. And then fulfilling briefs that aren't fulfilling your creative needs, and got to the extent where any time I had free time, just needed to chill or escape and drink and do whatever. Like, and that went on for a, a decade or so to where got to the extent where I just pretty much snapped or got exhausted. Where I was like. I actually cried, man, about it a few times. Just so mentally exhausted, and um, people just sort of, without meaning to, you know, just sort of beat the shit out of me. And so that was it was good, good learning. And that's where I changed. I was like, okay, man, I, I focus on my own work then, and I would fucking work out. <laughs> yeah, living the dream now. <laughs> living the dream. But it's it's a, it's an interesting thing you bring up there because um, it's it's something I I would imagine and Mark because I've spent a lot of time with Mark, obviously. Um, when he was doing the art full time um, back in the day um, like the commercial side of things it's hard to ignore that as well if you want to be able to live a, an artistic life and not have to um, you know do the chef stuff as well do you know the way so like you say yeah. if you were like you were, I know we're, we're talking a little bit there about the, the guidance counsellor and you, you'd be surprised at how many people we interview they talk about the guidance counsellor it's happened probably oh, yeah. six or seven <laughs> times it's mad like me and Mark had the same one um we, we we've never made uh, named him but uh you know not very not very impressive we'll see as well but anyway um so if you were if you were like talking to somebody who was younger who were just trying to get into that and maybe they are a little bit allergic almost to the the commercial side of things you know um it, like what would you say to them you know like, what would be the the game plan to say okay it's going to take 10 years maybe to build a reputation just but focus on that and then you can kind of <clears throat> build a, a mm. an income after that or what's what, what would be the yeah, like yeah, yeah, we we spoke and you have to be adaptable for sure you know you have to be madonna change your outfits every decade and um your look but uh if if i was to give advice and i'm basing this on only my experience and uh was that if i look back the, the key thing that i didn't have and it's another word that's used loads and it's boundaries i'd no fucking boundaries and um if i was if you have boundaries in place People be like, oh, you're, you, this isn't right or this isn't right. You know, this commercial work, it's a struggle that artists have, but we live in a monetary world. You've got to pay your fucking rent. Yeah. Uh, so where do you find that? And I think you find that through boundaries. And your boundaries are like, 
well, what's good for you? What makes you feel compromised or not compromised? You know, and I have those very clear now to extend to our project come and be like, now, like, so a simple boundary for a, an artist who might be saying, but like, I won't let a client speak to me like this. I'll only work from eight till six a day. You know, I won't be up till two in the morning stressing about shit. I'll make sure to fulfill other parts of my life, which will then help nurture my creative side of my uh, life. I'll make sure to, um, if, I, if I don't want to do this and it doesn't add to portfolio, well, what, what other work can I have? Will that be, will that be maybe, uh, can I value it down in money? So I might want to, I might give all my time and I don't, I won't get the value of uh, from a portfolio. So maybe the value is, is money in that instance. So there's different things you have, have to put in place, but boundaries will be definitely um, the number one from my experience. I didn't have that. And then the power now is good too, you know, like, and it's, it's rewarding. It's now to let people know that you have worth and, but then also to let yourself know that, you're, you're saying no because you're doing this for yourself and, and like if you saying no and yes to yourself helps you narrate in your mind your own self-worth because we struggle as visual artists and I feel like marketing now I'm not this in marketing companies or PR companies because I work with them and respect them and um but I from my experience I could see without them meaning to um you, you, as a visual artist, what they didn't realize is when you present your work, you're actually presenting yourself, you know, and you hold all your work in that work. And so if they critique it and rip the shit and say it's not good or it's not made the deadlines, you know, they're actually without meaning to like ridicule you and you take that on board. And that can be fucking very, very detrimental for a creative, you know, because we are sensitive, I feel. Um, and you have to be sensitive to be, have the awareness to open to respond to your environment, which creates great work um so i'm going on fucking down it no no already doing great, yeah. <laughs> but um i would just say the ways then for so for creative starting commercially like commercially is one thing if you want to make it so it's about it's just a bigger picture it's a bigger scope thing that i've learned you now and i've only had that awareness really in the last good few years um that it's not like goals shouldn't be just set on money. Um, it's easy for me to say now because I'm in a fucking an apartment. That, well, I'm actually in my girlfriend's apartment where I'm sitting here, and um, but you know I have, have everything that I need right now. So, um, but yeah, it's 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 just a respect thing for yourself and be managing that and know that like the fulfillment of other parts of your life it will come around like it's just it's more of like I, I talk I keep saying this in interviews integrated lifestyle and I've become this fucking ambassador of this word but I really believe it like you know that you nurture and you make time for those other parts of your life that it will then help this commercial aspect of your creative career too you know like you know if you go and do all the branded shit all the time no one will fucking want you you have to have co you have to have your own self worth worth and cultural significance and stuff like that for people to want want you too you know so, I, I think a, a big problem is like when a company will come to you and say, we love your style. We'd love you to do this project in your style. And then you hand it in and then they say, oh, could you change that and make that look like that? Well, then that's not my style anymore. Yeah. And then you're like, Ugh. I need to get paid. So, and I'm a young artist, so I'll just, yeah. I'll bend I, over, you know, and that's the problem. There's so many pieces out there that weren't my style. I had no style because I would just be like, whatever, doing a project. I had a, a company years ago, well, a company, <laughs> I mean, a few mates, um, called Crooked Type. And that was actually, no, that, that's what you would call a collective. It's a true collective. Because it was a, a group of us of different disciplines that came together, so we'd have briefs. But yeah, you would get a brief, let's say, golden pages, and they wanted to promote their new app and making the shit up. And uh, we did projects like that, you know, where for champion sports but there's good there's branded guidelines there so you're sort of replicating that and doing your own twist but you know great and pay the rent and add it to the commercial portfolio but it didn't it didn't fulfill here like you just became doing other people's sort of work and you weren't getting to do your own shit like you know and then so then i have to do that separately and i think that's what a lot of maybe artists have to do you have to just separate it like if someone wants you to do it and then you got a, a true it, it comes out to experience as well like you know if uh if, if someone asked me now to do the work 
and I present it and they go, oh, could you do it more like this? They're just going to get a, a polite fuck off because <laughs> I have separated myself from my separating my mindset of my work to my work. That's just one piece, you know, and that doesn't fully represent me. So I'm not, if they don't like it or criticize it, well, I'm not going to be fall into trap and say, okay, I'll fix this because I need to prove to them that I'm better, you know, that way. Yeah. And that's what's trying to get out with marketing companies. Like, again, I respect them. And, and I think subjectively, a lot of people is that they would, subconsciously sort of know, you know, that you hear the shit, oh, like, you love doing this, or, you know, when it comes to getting paid, or, uh, you love doing that, like, and it's apparently, like, well, you, you're getting paid, or you love to, they try to exploit sort of situations a little bit, um, and that's just because people think, and they're right, that we do fucking love doing it, yeah. and we love to paint, and we love to create, but we also love to get paid, and love to fucking be able to pay for a point and yeah. all this shit, you know, and I have to struggle for, for years, like, you know. So. I'd, I'd, I'd never been to art college, but I would hope there is something in in an art degree or whatever that uh, that talks about the business of art and actually to treat yourself like a proper business, you know. Uh, is Do you think there is anything, I don't know if there was when you were there. You that, know? Yeah, man, just you froze for a sec, sorry, man. Sorry, in, in art college, I wonder, is there like a, a class or a semester or whatever on, on like the business of art and how to actually monetize your art in a professional way? No, there isn't. Not that I have experienced it. Um, I was in Deliri in the creative building. Maybe they taught that over in the marketing. That's building. where Luke was in the other building. Was it an IDT yeah. you're in? Yeah, IDT, yeah. A, a, formal, a former alumni myself. I, that's where I, where I did my business. I was in the, the business prefab across the way. Uh, you know how to do it. Yeah, we yeah. weren't skilled on that shit, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a middle ground. You just could have all met in the middle and actually collaborated. Yeah, we, could have, we, could have, we could have met in the in the quad. In Baker's Corner. Yeah, in Baker's, Baker's Corner. Corner. Christ, that was a good board. With, uh, <laughs> with the eight euro uh, jugs of Foster's on a Thursday. You know the, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> great, great times. Uh, but, uh, but no, I, I, think that's a, I think that's a really important question, man, um, about uh, the, the business of art and stuff like that. And, uh, and a more another approach of like again, I talk about work, the work of your art and the work of self. Like that's a, it's a it's a serious important part of a business. I think you know because you can compromise on the value of yourself, and then your business fucking isn't commercially viable and you got bust. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, the 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 mechanics of a business need to be addressed when it comes to art because and and i can see it because i've artists reaching out to me all the time like looking for advice or we'd have an exhibition and i'm sort of trying to get in behind the veil and trying to see where they are with their mindset or business sacrament now have a very very modest understanding of it and uh any questions i need to know or ring my accountant and i say to speak to me like a dummy what does that mean and, it's, and that's how that's how you learn you surround yourself by people who are knowledgeable in those those areas uh, but i think we need to be because uh, it is an elephant in a room where it needs to be addressed. And if you, you shy away from it as an artist, and if you if you get to the root core of that, that's back to then um, self-worth. My 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 understanding of it's like, well, you know, I, I don't think I deserve to be making 50 Gs a year on my art because I'm not good enough for, you know, let the market dictate that. Like, you yeah. know, like... And so I'd, I would love to see that. And it's exciting when you start opening that door. Like, I fucking love it. I was on the phone to my accountant yesterday for, i say, 40 minutes. And we're like, I'm like, shocking. Open up in Google spreadsheets. And what about this bit and this bit? I'm like, yeah. I'm finally, like, nurturing that a little bit, feeding it. And I'm watching it go. And then it can give you certain objectives and goals in as well with your own art, you know. I think, I think we lose a lot of great artists because of, of that factor, that they can't. They go off and become accountants, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you're doing the grand work there. You're going to come back now, 40, boom, like. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> Isn't his background? I think he was an art. I think he was, a, he, he was an accountant of some sorts or something before he got into art. Who? Jeff Goons. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. I think uh, Chartered Accountant, something like that. No uh, way. And there you go. There you go, Mark. It's never too late. Get, get cracked on that. <laughs> and Jeff so, Goons, man, didn't come in till. Ah oh, man, my history of art is is is, is shit. But yeah, he was a late bloomer. Tell us, tell us about some of, some of the artists that you would inspire you or that you love just to look at their stuff. It doesn't have to be inspire your work, but some good artists out there. Well, past or present. Um, 
I'm I'm quite current and present. Like I'm very local in, in my in my outlook, and I'm and I'm, I'm influenced by a lot of people around me and stuff like that. Uh, artists that I love that are part of my uh, atelier um, exhibition program would be like someone like Aches, Peter Doyle, um, Stephen Burke. Shane Griff, those are four people on exhibition. We we're meant to have a show there, um, a group show. In a, on like the day that the T shirt locked it down on the twelfth of March. And that was uh there's a group show there, seven artists there as well, Irish artists. Um but they inspire me because they one thing I love to see, they're super, super skilled, super, super talented. But I think like to be to be um to survive in this uh, environment, you need, I think, ambition and drive are really, really key factors like to be. So you can be the most creative person in the room, but uh, not be motivated and not produce work and pop off a like a, a masterpiece once every so often. But but if you're really, really motivated, then you can sort of tune and um, uh, increase your ability of craft better. And so I really look at that. That and aspire to that when I see those people paint so much then I I, I get motivated to paint too and just, um, I would consider myself very very motivated through my whole rate of um, practice and I love to see people doing that too but yeah like the the in terms of like old masters I love sort of um, mid-century work Frank Stella Bridget Riley up art movements like that uh, hardline art you know um, I think it really resonates with me and you can see that in my work I've sort of loosened up a lot more now in the last few years I think because personally I've probably loosened up a little bit um, and um, but yeah it, it goes across everything I'll be influenced by uh, architects uh, Zaha Hadid um, fuck man the index is huge like uh, you know and Instagram is a great way to sort of Sure, channel all that into one space and scroll and flick and look at it and keep updated. Um, yeah, it's it, that's a that's a big conversation, but there's not one person really. There's Matisse, you know, you can see his influence in my work without me even realizing until about 20 people said it. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the I think the 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 crossover there is, is was uh, was our technique in creating that. I used to do a lot of paper collage before painting because I would base my structure on um, composition not on line but on quantity of colour and form and how they the relationships between them and the best way to do those sort of discovery um, compositions which was through paper it was mm. the easiest way rather than just drawing outlines that wouldn't connect well with me. so and Matisse is that's you know he's all a flat colour and stuff like that so I'm interested to, to, to know the kind of start to finish of how you actually start the project and finish it L looking at maybe the home bird one the latest one you did yeah what, what way does it start obviously starts with a bit of inspiration then do you, do you go do you do a graphic design and 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 then print it out what way does it all work or is that a se trade secret uh, no 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 i think transparency is the best way to learn and grow i share all secrets um when it comes to only when it comes to art <laughs> the, <laughs> the, uh, so what you're trying to do there is you're trying to you're trying to ask me a question to put in a very linear form. What mm. is it to do it? And I've learned that it doesn't work like that. You know, it's a very abstract approach to creativity. So um, that line is just a big fucking knot of like a shoelace tied up or whatever. It's just not. You need to break the barriers of that mindset. If that's how creative work. But if you want me to try and fit it into that mold, that square peg into a circle hole will be. The word homebird came about um, 10 years ago when I painted at Newmarket Square in my old studio. I'm a homebird from a relationship that I have with Damien Dempsey, where he texted it to me one time. Then I said that word for ages, then resonated with me all these times. And if I wanted to like, really get to the mechanics of it, it was like I was earning and um, yearning, sorry, to, is that word? My brain's uh, to go travel for years and years and years. And always looking away and away and so i did that through graffiti and through my travels i learned so much that actually dublin's a great place and it's uh you know i'm very very blessed to be uh be here like in a neutral you know a neutral country and the capital of it and you know 
the cards are luckily dealt well for me. Like so, I got to understand that, and I realized how great Dublin is, and came back, started writing those messages. Mesa, Mesa loves you. It's an appreciation to the city. Realized, you know, this I'm a homebird there in that way. Um, so that story was always with me, and I ended up tra- creating a, a clothing label years ago called Homebird with a, a friend of mine, Leah Burke. Now in a very uh, modest way just creating t-shirts and it's great response to that and there's another thing i'd love to talk about social engagement of art and the art as a vehicle for that um but uh so that word was there then we're fucking literally here at home and stuff like that and it wasn't like i'm gonna do a print now it's the best time to do it just sort of they're all underlined there and then just things pop up the odd time and then i don't know where i was it could have been having a shower and it just popped up it's like homebird again yeah. and i was like God, everyone's like the word home and what home represents to us now is different than what it was. And it's a place, you know, of business now and safety and security and you know, like all those sort of stories that are going through my head. And and so then it came to like, how can that story be shared? And the easiest way for me through practice and what my tools that I have is to create a print edition and look at that and we mentioned repeal and look at that engagement there and how community can come together in some capacity so all those stories are just gone in my head and uh the resolution or the result was was a print and a painting i think it's it's fabulous because that's your that's your answer there yeah, <laughs> no, that makes sense. yeah that's right. and we, we even in damien dempsey as well which we're big fans of <laughs> i think we talk about him every time on this podcast as well. <laughs> we're, He's an ambassador for young men like us and obviously women too. But and I, I speak from because I'm a man, but man, that is a voice for a lot of us, I think, you know. And um, no matter where we came from, our backgrounds, I know we all, I know you two as well. I don't even fucking know you have your own struggles. And I did too. And he was a voice in my ear that really coached me when I was younger and got me through some shit sort of times, you know. So um, I'd be hard pushed to hear anyone that would badmouth demo except the odd toxic man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the. Uh... <laughs> But out the, with the homebird stuff, I think it's it's interesting as well because um, a lot of people are at home and they are angry that they're being kept in. They're you know there's a, a lot of you know people are struggling with even relationships that they're in at home. You know they want to get out, but the homebird kind of message, like you know making it okay to kind of say that you're a homebird, that you this, this is a time where we can kind of enjoy, spend time with our family. And it's a little bit the, like the pressure's off a little bit in some way. Yeah. Do you know that way? Yeah. For um, sure, because we're so, always on this trajectory of like bigger, further, faster, harder, whatever. Like keep going, going on. And now it's just we we, we like reverted to the other way that like oh wow, you're you're actually more like this real value and like commend and people being commended for doing nothing and staying at home and chilling and yeah. and then re that rewiring and um, reevaluation is is I think uh, a really great thing that's come out of this this. this yeah. Thing. I- I think it's like a reset, isn't it? I think it was getting out of control and now it's a bit of a reset. Like, hmm. and in the simplest form, I wasn't painting. And I'm an artist, so I'm meant to fucking paint. And I wasn't painting. And hmm. I was all put to the bottom of the list. And now, you know, all these projects. And then within one day, all my jobs were closed. Everything gone. Hmm. And studio closed. And it brought me back to painting again. And I'm blessed for that, like, you know, to, for that, yeah, Wait. refresh. You mentioned there the, the social engagement and the and I know a lot of people would have maybe come to know your work through the uh, through the repeal of the eighth I think was it two thousand sixteen or something like that. Yeah, I painted, I painted it a few times, twice, and they painted well, over it. And one, the first this time, is, this is what I wanted to talk to you about because I was doing some research before this and just like just googling around and there's like there's videos of people <laughs> painting over murals and all. Is that does that really get to you? What's like you know if you've put your fucking no, that, was, that was that was like. That was really, really interesting to watch as like, I don't know if it's appropriate word to say a social experiment, um, but to see how people engage with the work, you know, and uh, I'm not precious to it so that, that much because it's uh, it's in the public realm and I painted work in public realm since I was 15. So it comes and goes and once you paint it aside, it's left to the elements, whatever those elements are. If it's bad weather, the building getting knocked, people not agreeing with the work painting over or another com- another artist you know want to do another wall um so that was you know that that the journey had already been taken many times when i saw this repeal mirror being painted over and the purpose of it being painted over was to remove it to stop its publicity yes 
it, everything is based on energy, you know, for sure. So you're just feeding that energy more and more and more by painting over. You're just putting all that energy on it, like, you know, and uh, so they were, it was counter counterproductive for the note side. And um, was it the note side that was driving that? Because I didn't actually, I just saw the video and it was like a two minute thing. I didn't really get the context. Was it, was it because there was like protests about, the, or, you know? Or yeah, whatever? because I, I can't, man, to be honest, uh, I don't know all the, there's so many yeah. different things said, but like there's a loophole there where you weren't allowed to paint it, you know, because right. politically motivated. And, um, and then then I was allowed and then we painted again and they painted over again and it just gave more theatrics to this piece and more of a voice and 100%. Twitter was blown up and then it, then the journey continued then we talked about the sweats you know doing the sweats and people taking ownership of that artwork and that was a nice thing to do it's like I don't own that I don't own that I'm not I'm not a woman like I don't go through that struggle so I can't be I can't be saying what I did my opinions on that it's like I'm literally just that messenger I was like I had this opportunity the time was there and there was it was intuitive and instinctive i mean and we just painted it and it and then just let it take growth and you can look at models like jim fitzpatrick with the Che of our image you know not taking ownership of that and look at that so that was in the back of my mind it's like i don't own this piece you know this is a shared space and then it resonated with a lot of people and it, it became one of if not the the like emblem or i come for that for that for that side yeah, I think it, it definitely did. That's uh, like even when looking through all the the pieces that you've that you've done as well as doing some Google imaging before this, um, it is still for me it's the one that stands out just as the most impact. You know, um, which is which is uh, amazing. Um, do you now that things are a little bit different? Um, we're not going to go out for a few weeks or whatever. Are you thinking up your your now? Yeah, like you said, you've got a little bit of time to be creative. Um, are you thinking up the b next big project that you want to do or is it are you going to uh, do more s stuff in the vein of the the homebird uh, kind of campaign um i think the homebird i think that's i think that's done now like you know it's done and you don't um no point dragging it out anymore it's it's it did its job i had a goal there of trying to lose goal of trying to raise about 30k for the matter so just a doggy wants to go in. Oh, sorry dude sorry <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, the it did uh, you know I had a goal there of like thirty k to raise and, and did that. That was one component of it. But like just to see that sort of social engagement and see how um, art can be this vehicle or tool and just watch, just watch that. I find that really, really. In, it's just really really interesting and there's a lot of components to just one painting there you know you can give back people take ownership of a shared message it all sort of like it's it's a lot of people's thought processes just with a one graphic and um but for me right now uh yeah i have like 20 notions a day and of what i'm gonna do and maybe edit a collective 2000 while we're in here I'll, i might um i might do one <laughs> but like I, i'm not I'm, I'm i'm really i'm one of these heads that it's really sort of stays in the moment and each day and gets on with it and then and i find myself when i skip ahead anxiety kicks in a little bit too much for me i'm worried and stuff but that's i have to re re rewind it a bit um but i want to have a big exhibition i want to paint walls again but i'm still also like availing <laughs> Of this now and enjoying it and i'm doing little photoshop gigs like i'm buildings and sort of putting them out there on the internet and sort of looking at feedback and i'm like jesus christ it gets more response than when i paint the fucking thing i should just <laughs> sit at home and do photoshop jobs <laughs> <laughs> the uh yeah, yeah. Do, do you know that just this kind of just came to me there like the first time i ever seen your work i was on the air coach and i was coming back uh I don't know where it was, but I was coming back. Um, and it was an overnight flight, and I was in. No, when you you get off, and I don't sleep on planes, right? So I was really oh. run down and stuff like that. And I saw, yeah, the the greed is a knife on the down oh, the yeah, yeah. And just, it just hit me like, as obviously a big Damon Dempsey fan, and I I didn't know, I didn't really know much about. It. I looked into that after uh, and stuff like that. Like, but is that? But did you uh, come into contact with Damon just through the kind of Dublin creative scene or? was that like part of a campaign that you were doing with him to get that message out there what was the story behind that so that was originally i was a big day my fan years ago and saying it's this voice in my ear and he really helped me and coached me and I almost felt like you know at times he was just singing to me and uh i was really lost at certain times and anyway there was a moment where i was in my studio in market square and 
I don't know if it's the fanboy in me or what, but I was just like, well, what if I took these lines and transcribed them onto walls? You know, and, uh, and that was as simply as that. And, I, and a guy, Johnny Moy, a friend of mine, who was helping me, um, who was just a mate. We're just floating about. I, I don't know if he's working for me at the time, but he was, I said to him here, do you know fucking, because he was on the music scene and a uh, big DJ years ago. And uh, I said, do you know Damon Dempsey by any chance? I think you get to meet him. Meet him. And he's like, yeah, I know Fika, his road manager. And so he set it up. I met Dame. I went to go meet Dame. I was like, you know, it's yeah. fucking shit. Yeah. Um, 2000 and I'd say 2009 or 8, 2009 maybe. And um, I was really nervous. I'm going to meet in Krogan's. And uh, so I'd done up a little presentation where I took some of his lines and I just photo, just typed and photoshopped it onto a wall. So to say, this is the idea. And I went into Krogan's and he wasn't there. And I was like, oh, fuck, fuck, fuck. You know what you do when you're waiting, you go to the jacks. So I was like... <laughs> The worst thing to be sitting there alone in a pub waiting on Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, the way Grogan's, they change the toilets now, actually, it fucks with your head because it make the women's and men's and men's and women's. <laughs> but when you go in, there's like this little narrow bit. Do you remember before you go into yeah. the yeah. thing? And as I go to that, there are big dudes coming yeah. at the same time. And I was like, so much shit. <laughs> <laughs> I was say, the, the worst place to be in a narrow yeah, space. I uh, with this myself <laughs> they, you know, in jacks like this. He's like, his hands were still wet. And yeah, it's just like there. Like, yeah. I know he's cool as cucumber as I was. He's like, meet your soy brother. I was like, yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was my the most um, important presentation I ever made to anyone. So important that there was sweat dripping from my nose and I was hitting the laptop I remember wow and after pitching this whole idea he just goes uh, so you want me to I'm going to write my words in the waltz and I was like yeah pretty much that's it man <laughs> <laughs> he goes just like shut up man you fuck yeah. uh, but me and Damo came I consider him a good friend and a mentor you know and uh, there he did so that's where I started and yeah. he started just texting me and emailing me like fucking loads of lyrics and lyrics that resonated with me I took and I printed them off and get texts in the middle of the night and I wish I screen grabbed them back then you know and the emails of like the same line and 50 different variables and so one was from an old song Greed is the Night from Scars Run Deep and uh, that's based on um, uh, English Rule years ago obviously but I took it out of context and that's a nice thing to do when um when you just look at that, and so this is during the this is during the boom recession time, and down there at the Docklands, which is an important part of our history, that whole landscape just got fucking demolished, yeah. and then left these wastelands. And I just thought, God, that'd be beautiful. And I saw that horde, and I was like, Wouldn't that be sick? Now, like, represent Greed's knife and scars on deep, and this is these are the scars of the city. All these and, uh, all these buildings it. that were like half done. Do you remember for like five years? Yeah. It was like a like a like a graveyard of you know like the the developer stuff. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was mad. Anglo, of Anglo and all that like there, yeah. So, um, and then everybody having to pass by who were, had to emigrate and they're, they're looking at that on their way out in the air coach. Yeah. It's a, yeah, there, was, there was never a, like a mad agenda. It was just like, oh, that's a good spot and that, and that, and that, go to paint that, you know, and that, that really kickstarted the people are like, what the fuck's that about? And people knew Damo's <laughs> words and then, so Damo went on the radio and spoke about it. That, uh, we ended up doing like 20 something murals around, around Dublin. Uh, ending up the last one in Ballymun in one of the blocks there before they knocked it and um, then in 2010 we had a show for uh, we compiled all the pictures and made some original works and in uh, Smithfield we did an exhibition called They Are Us and I donated we raised 30 grand we got the medical van for a song community with that and uh, again okay. there you go it was like the one part was painting and the joy of that and interacting with people but then we saw the social engagement how like Dublin came together so we go there um, came together and the the power of art, you know, and how it changed and get for for good in some instances, you know, in that instance for sure. So yeah, that and was another big, another big, sorry, another big part of what you what you're doing is the the meditation and the, the flow state. So we haven't even talked about that. Mm. How did that come about? Um, that came about um, me finding meditation, discovering meditation. Uh, shit with dates man but i would say like maybe three years ago now maybe um definitely struggling with myself really, really fucking anxious i was living in london out of sorts um falling to the crutches of boozing and all this sort of shit you know all unhealthy habits and not happy with myself blaming others all the fucking same shit and uh and i started practicing tm 
uh, translated meditation. It's when I moved back, when I moved back to Dublin, and uh, it was like an eye opener, a whole game changer, and um, gave me that awakening. So Jesus, I feel like so Jesus. Fucking true, man. No, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. <laughs> So, well, okay. yeah. <laughs> I hope you make an impact on Mark. I think he could do some meditation. I don't know. He, you know, he's uh, like, I, I oh, we, we did a whole podcast on Matthew McConaughey's speeches about uh, positivity and, <laughs> yeah. and all that stuff. So don't be afraid to open up. <laughs> so, um, but it, it resonated with me because, like, it definitely was what I was preaching out in the streets where you say, don't be afraid or live in love and you're alive. And I just say, uh, it really made me feel like I was living more of a truer self and I, and I got rid of the, a lot of the crutches and those unhealthy habits and forgave myself and loved myself more. And so meditation was the opener. And then through that day, skip along, skip along, and started training the gym, uh, call number 17, um, just there, Harcourt Street. And the owner's John Belton and um, his partner, uh, Adrian Murphy, they're meant to get married this year. I don't know if that's still happening there or what. But... Um, like-minded people started training there, got on really, really fucking well. And you know, when you when you like hanging out with people, you're like, and you're, we're all working really hard. Adrian had the idea of like, would there be an opportunity of us working together in some capacity? And because again, reverting back to the integrated lifestyle, I know when I trained well, I ate better, I was surrounded by better like-minded people, made me produce work, have a better work ethic, better in relationships, a family, business, everything. So that sort of was part and parcel of that. And um so Ada had the had said it, and she she came up with the brainchild. She was like saying, um, "Is there maybe there's an opportunity here of doing because we have the mats in the gym, we roll them out and for stretching and stuff. Is there an opportunity there to put art on it?" She did a bit of research, and uh, and we said, "Yeah." And I was just like, "Cool, this sort of encompasses everything I preach and talk about, and integrating everything together, and this is it all in in in, in one piece." And then we talked about limited edition art prints and how. They sell and you hang them on the wall, you know. So they, there it is. There we can fulfill that art part. We can there's there's hot eyelets in the piece in the mats. We can hang it on the wall and it's functional art. And so that was it. And uh, I had the like with the homebird, the word flow state was sitting in my brain, or I wrote it somewhere from someone had said it or something. I was just like, oh, that flow state, you know, when you're in it. And you guys know we're sort of in it now with our conversation. Um, and a flow state, it's like the sweet spot when I'm painting. Where I'm not too busy. Uh, but I'm busy enough and it's literally like any fuck, it's like my hand and eye coordination is so bang on, like there's nothing I can do that can go wrong. That's that flow state. And I just thought it was a nice word and uh, created an identity for it. And I can't think of a better name for it now. Like it's like- Yeah, it's perfect. It's just, when I saw that, it, was like, it just impacted immediately. I'm like, I get, I get the- I get what they're trying to do here. It's it's perfect uh, symbol for that. Yeah, and it's and it's a it's it's you know it's at the start and it's it was a what you call it um, like a project that you just uh, do. I can't think of a word, um, but like just passion a project. Passion project. Thank you. Uh, passion project. And now you know we then we talk about the self worth thing. Well, oh, you know, passion project is that just a a language and terminology for us not holding our wealth of our true values to this or our own. And we're like, no, hold on. This is a fucking business. Like, and this is done good. And it's been picked up by people, you know, like really like the responses keep selling out, man. It's like wild. Yes. And the response is good because I think people now customers can, um, they, under, they don't just look for a product, but they look for a, a true story and people can see trying uh, People have this better ability um, of seeing true people and see if it's like it's like businesses are transparent now, you know. And if you if you if you have integrity and you mean to really do it, and they, and they know that we're doing it for just the love of it and enjoying it, and um, yeah, it's taking flight and it's and it's it's beautiful to see it. And we're we're now we're, I'm actually after this now I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, get in a call with the guys and uh, talk about it more now and sort of see. We got some sound advice off this guy. This bit, we got on a Zoom call with him there a few days ago, and we looked for an outsider's opinion on it and gave us some great advice and uh, how to sort of next steps because it's a new venture. We 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 don't have a lot of experience in it, so it's just a really good project and see where it goes and enjoying it and yeah, it's just fucking cool. Stuff. Sounds exciting. Yeah, it's it's genuinely brilliant. Like it's exciting to do and. Just something completely kind of different as well. Like I said, I, I love you, you said something there. Like it's a uh, usable art as well. So it's, it's not just to 
to, to look at so it can be integrated into what you're doing with what your what your workouts and everything like that love all that like hey mark no hold on boys <laughs> <All right. laughs> Well, it plays with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what do you have, have there, Mater? Is that a, <laughs> is that a flow state, Matt? Uh, we, actually, uh, we actually do use them. Like, like, the, the, should have had that lo- on the wall behind you, yeah. like I do on mine. Yeah. The wall there, yeah. Anyway, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got, on state, yeah. 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 I tell you what, they, they love that down in Greystones. <laughs> yeah, they would actually. Yeah, so uh, I put a, I put a link in the description here, and we'll. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a great domain name to have as well. Yeah, <laughs> but um, class. Mark, we're we're pushing an hour here already. Can we get get no, a couple yeah, of those uh, those those uh, uh, maybe two or three of these questions? I know the I know Al's got a another call coming up, so that's all right. Yeah, just some some kind of quick fire, um, stuff. So what what's your so- favorite social media and why? Uh, I don't like in uh, social media, but I'm fucking like handcuffed to it. Like uh, yeah. Instagram is what I look at because uh, it's a visual platform, and Twitter is grand, but it doesn't really suit what I what I do so much. So that's it. And Facebook, I don't fucking look at that. Only if I have to, I don't know. I have to try and find someone yeah. <laughs> from a decade ago. <laughs> what What time do you get up at in the morning? What time do you go to bed? Uh, usually up at about six a.m. And uh, I'd love to get up later, but I can't. I'm, I'm worried like that. And then uh, I used to go to bed a lot earlier, but it's like 11, 12 now. Like, so I work in about six hours a night. I wish I got more. Um, like I went for a jog there before I was chatting to you guys to sort of spark my brain up a bit. And uh, yeah, it's, I, I know it has an impact. Like I'd love to be one of those eight hour sleepers. Ooh, lovely. Yeah, <laughs> we do. Um, what, do you, what do you fear? Um, Jesus, what do I fear? Uh, I, I I hold real value in my health and sort of stuff like that. So, and I think that's coming of age. I'm I'm, I'm 38 now. And it's John Belt and the same thing. Like, you know, you get like, and I think we should talk about like, you know, lads get a ball ache or something. Like, oh god, oh god, what's this? You know, and and uh, <laughs> you got the fear, and then you know, fucking manifesting that. You know, I, I find so. To be honest, it's the health sort of thing, like, you know, especially in the environment we're in now, I'm fucking genuinely, like, I'm not just saying I feel blessed that I have my health and uh, mm-hmm. stuff like that, so. Cool. If you could advise someone to, to learn one skill, what would it be? Um, self-awareness. Work on that, nurture that, you know, and sit with yourself. And because uh, the discovery of that, everything else will sort of fall better in place and... It's it's like it's like the it's like the building blocks for anything. Like you know, if you want to give good advice to anything, you've got to fully fully aware. And then once you better understanding, I'm not saying I fucking have it sussed, but I work on it as much as I can. I mean, body weight and meditation is a key part of that. But then that can then the building blocks for healthy relationships, healthy business, healthy lifestyle. Very good. Is there any first first steps into meditation that someone could take if you want to get into it? Uh, first step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, I, I went, I went knee deep straight into it with TM. You know, you do like a three day course, and it's like you, you meditate for forty minutes a day, and that sort of stuff. And did that for a few years. But uh, there's a good friend of mine, Connor, and um, he is uh, he's a meditation teacher, and he teaches meditation in my studio. And he's a dude. I can send you a link to it or whatever. Yeah. What's his name? What's his full name? Uh, well, let's say uh, Cravington now, but I was, like I don't know how. I'll send you on on Instagram anyway. Yeah. Oh. I, I don't know what his like handle is, but he teaches a. Um, oh, it's just Connor Creighton. Go. Oh. <laughs> that is nice. <laughs> um, but he's a dude, and uh, he 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 gives a, like very very like when he teaches meditation, he does this like for beginners, and sort of makes it very practical, you know that way. And it's all down to just you deserve fucking five ten minutes to yourself and give yourself that, and it's sitting with yourself. And sometimes that's hard for people because it's you know it's 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 hard. Like you want to be distracted or you want to be run away from yourself, but I'm telling you, it's it's liberating. Like when you when you do, you know. Um. Last one. Is there a book that you'd recommend to to let's say the eighteen year old you? Uh, I don't read books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fucking shit at it, man. I've read a few, and I'm trying to. I'm I'm in the middle of the, the I'm in the middle of the pair of now. Is it in my bag right now? Like now, I mean, I don't Can't read totally. books, books. The odd time. I bumped uh, into him in a park in Canada. He was sitting there, looked like he was meditating. Who? <laughs> uh, your man who wrote that book. No way. Totally. I was walking. I was living in Canada. 
after the last recession me and uh my now wife moved over there for a few years and um i just saw him and i i didn't really i hadn't read the book yet but uh my ma was you know obsessed with all his books over the years like and um i saw pictures of him and stuff like that and i saw him and i was like i think that's e cartoli over there so I went over <laughs> so I was he's a wild looking cat like i don't think you miss him looking, yeah and uh like, one of those dudes that grows a beard there nothing else yeah, there it's, it's very very strange i was like oh how's it going and he said it was going well and then that was kind of it like <laughs> but uh, i had to go say hello <laughs> anyway um so thanks thanks very much for giving me all this time in the morning i know uh, we started a little bit early but um uh, so it was it's such an interesting chat and i think loads of people that are listening to this uh podcast all our listeners they're they're it's diverse as well there's people who are into art people are into business people who are just into you know living good lives are trying to build a the kind of integrated lifestyle that you're talking about so i think yeah. i think people get a lot out of that um so thanks very much and uh this will be out in a, i think next week i think mark what do you think yeah i'd say next okay. week next wednesday yeah perfect yeah so until then guys thanks very much thanks Mel. Thanks, guys. Okay.